the United States was inching towards their goal of ratifying the Constitution. With only two more states needed, many people were wondering how the planters of South Carolina would receive the Constitution. In May of 1788, they would find out. But before that, let's dig into the historical context so you can understand the ambitions and fears of South Carolina voters. The task of establishing the colony of Carolina was carried out by wealthy planters, some of whom had been influential men in the colony of Barbados. They had proven their skill at administering a slave society in the West Indies, and the English government hoped they could replicate their success on the mainland. This is all pretty far removed from the Constitution, but I think it's important to understand that the reason for the Carolina colony's existence was the establishment of a slave economy that would make money for the crown. Fast forward a hundred years, and the colony was doing what it was made to do. It was now administered as two colonies, North and South Carolina, and within South Carolina, the low country along the coast had become dotted with huge plantations run by an aristocratic elite with a large workforce of slaves. Out of all the 13 colonies, South Carolina had the largest percentage of enslaved people, at about 43% at the time of independence. The capital, Charleston, was the largest port in the South, and it was the fourth largest city in all of the colonies. The inland area of the state, the upcountry, had been settled too, but this part of the colony looked very different from the low country. There were hardly any roads. Farms were small, usually worked by families and a handful of enslaved people. There were no formal courthouses, jails, or schools. Forget representation in Parliament, they weren't even represented in the South Carolina Commons House. All investment was concentrated in the Low Country, and after the Revolution, the coastal elite essentially removed the British from the pyramid, placing themselves at the top. By this point, about 80% of the population was found in the upcountry, but their representatives only held 40% of the seats in the State House. The elites successfully fought off reapportionment for decades but they did concede to move the capital from Charleston to the central town of Columbia. This was as much of an olive branch to the upcountry as it was a way to keep the state government safe from a potential British invasion by sea. When it came to the Articles of Confederation, South Carolina was a consistent voice for reform. Or I should say, the low country dominated government of South Carolina was pro-reform. Their first attempt at an amendment to the Articles came before the end of the war, one of the Articles of Confederation's very few requirements was that the rights of a citizen of, say, Pennsylvania would need to be extended and protected if that Pennsylvanian was to travel to another state, say, South Carolina. South Carolina was worried that if a Pennsylvanian happened to be a freed black man, that the overreaching, no-good federal government would force the poor plantation owners to abandon their southern heritage and guarantee his rights as a free citizen. South Carolina wanted the Articles of Confederation to recognize that the Privileges and Immunities Clause would only apply to white citizens. South Carolina also supported less stomach-turning amendments, such as granting commerce regulation and taxation powers to the federal government that we've talked about before. All these attempts at amendments failed, of course, and their proponents, like Charles Pinckney, grew more and more exasperated at the lack of progress. He and many other elites jumped at the idea of attending the Constitutional Convention in 1787. Pinckney and the rest of the South Carolina delegation in Philadelphia had three principal goals. Strengthen the federal government, protect slavery and the slave trade, and don't let the other states get carried away with democratic excesses. Like most attendees, they came away with mixed feelings about the Constitution. The federal government would be strengthened, but their other two goals were not met according to them. Despite scoring some protections for slavery, like the Three-Fifths Compromise, the Fugitive Slave Clause, and a guarantee to continue the foreign slave trade for 20 years, in their eyes, it still wasn't enough. The fact that the House of Representatives would be directly elected by the people was too much democracy for their taste. There was also apprehension that the federal government could intervene in state elections, which to elites in South Carolina was a red flag that they could be forced to play fair with the upcountry. But by and large, the ruling low country estate owners were fed up with the Articles of Confederation, so they were favorable to the Constitution. The legislature met in 1788 and voted in favor of calling a convention. Since the coastal low country had a disproportionate advantage, they had no trouble calling a convention, despite several upcountry delegates speaking against the Constitution. They were also able to narrowly push through several conditions that would sway the convention heavily in favor of the Federalists. The convention would be held in Charleston, not Columbia. If that wasn't enough, South Carolina also required, among other things, that a voter hold at least 50 acres of land or paid equivalent to that amount of land in taxes. 
Of course, this wasn't a problem for huge estate owners in the coastal region, but it did disqualify a large number of small farmers on the frontier. Finally, the legislature would use the same method of distributing seats to the convention as they did for the state house. This meant that they would give 143 seats to a region containing about 29,000 non-enslaved people, while the upcountry with a population of about 110,000 non-enslaved people would only receive 93. The delegates met at the Old Exchange, a building that acted as Charleston's customs house, as well as a location for the majority of the city's slave auctions. The convention began on May 12, 1788. Not much survives of the proceedings, but they had been in session a few days when news of Maryland's ratification reached Charleston. The news reportedly put considerable wind behind the Federalists and demoralized anyone who was unsure of the Constitution. One of the delegates critical to the Constitution was General Thomas Sumter. Seeing the way that the convention was going, he tried for a Hail Mary. He put forward a motion to adjourn the convention without taking a vote on ratification. This appealed to many Southerners that were unsure of how the crucial state of Virginia would react to the Constitution. Many didn't want to be part of the new Union if there wasn't a strong Southern state like Virginia to have their back. But the Federalists had too much momentum to be stopped. After a vote was taken, Sumter was forced to admit defeat, and not for the last time in Charleston's history. After this measure failed, Federalists knew they had the votes, and therefore were in a position to ratify. But surprisingly, a Federalist delegate brought forth a handful of amendments that he recommended to add alongside ratifying the Constitution. Why would they do this? Well, the Federalist majority was aware that they actually represented less than half of the state. If the opposition walked away with no concessions, it could lead to unrest. Even now, Pennsylvania opponents to the Constitution were spreading stories about how Federalists in Pennsylvania had, in their eyes, held an unfair convention and pushed through a document that the state, outside of Philly, did not approve of. They were preparing to stir up trouble in the already disaffected upcountry of South Carolina. The amendments were as follows. Prohibit the federal government from interfering in state elections unless the state neglected or refused to hold those elections. Give state supremacy over all issues not explicitly given to the federal government. Restrict Congress's power to tax, but allow it to force collection if a state refused to pay. And finally, they wanted to clarify the wording of the Religious Oaths Clause in Article 6, which was a little ambiguous. After no major concerns were raised at these amendments, the delegates took a vote on ratification. By a vote of 149 to 73, South Carolina became the eighth state to ratify the Constitution. A modern analysis of the delegates voting yay or nay has found that the Federalists represented only about 39% of the free inhabitants of the state, while the nays represented 52.2%. But the inclusion of the four amendments softened the blow, and the public backlash in the upcountry was not as severe as in Pennsylvania or even Maryland. If just one more state ratified the Constitution, the document would go into effect for those nine. The good news? Next month, three more states would have the opportunity to ratify the Constitution. The bad news was that there were no more easy wins. The remaining states were either dragging their feet, disinterested about the Constitution, or in New Hampshire's case, they had already failed once to ratify. The first of the June conventions was the most populous and prestigious of all the states by far. Their decision would have ripple effects in all the other states, and besides Rhode Island, their population was the most suspicious of the Constitution yet. Virginia was up next. <laughs> 